Welcome to the latest Rebel Wisdom podcast. Um, I'm really excited about this one because it's some of the best interviews that we've done recently that we're making live at the same time as we're releasing this. I'm going to show some clips from them. And there is a theme, and the theme is masculinity. And I guess the sub-theme is it's, what, about a year now since Me Too and since a lot of these gender dynamics started becoming really prevalent and really part of the culture and that's been a big theme of a lot of the stuff that we've been doing. So what we've got coming up at the same time um, is two interviews and another round of content probably about a week after that. So we have an interview with Cassie J who directed the Red Pill film and we've got an interview with Warren Farrell who is often called the father of the men's movement but I think our experience when we met him in America and interviewed him is that he's got a lot more to offer than that sort of characterization. He's a therapist, he does couples counselling, he's deeply interested in how to create healthy relationships. And this ultimately I think is the theme of a lot of the content we're putting out is what if, if what we're seeing at the moment is tantamount to a kind of dysfunctional relationship between men and women playing out on the wider cultural stage, what does a healthy relationship look like? Kind of linked to what we've been discussing recently around the shadow, I think along with that question is what is the shadow of masculinity, but then also less discussed, what is the shadow of femininity? Um, and I was thinking about this but before, I think about this a lot actually, um, because the shadow of the masculine, that, that was the Me Too um, movement as well, was kind of showing up the shadow of the masculine, which is obviously something that needs to happen. Uh, the shadow of the feminine is harder to pin down, I think. It, if you look at it in, if you were to take it just as a thought experiment in kind of uh, Taoist terms and you had each opposite implies the other, but there really have to be opposites. So if you see, and they would in, in, in kind of Chinese Taoism, they see the masculine is obvious and it's bright and it's right there. So the masculine shadow would be the same. It's, it's so clear. It's domination, yeah. it's control, it's, it's sort of, yeah. it's aggressive. It's all these things that are quite easy to look at yeah. and easy to define. Absolutely. So by, by that, then the shadow of the feminine should automatically be shrouded mysterious, complex, and I think that is one of the powerful things about the red pill, the whole phenomena of red pilling, is that it lifts a veil on, aha, wait, this, there's a sense with the red pill, I think, that a lot of people have watching it, and I certainly did, where I had a sense of, well, the very water, the very cultural water I'm swimming in is not what it appeared to be. I think it, I want to interject here because it, we're two men talking about the, the female shadow. Sure. What I want to say, and what I think is really interesting about the content we've got coming up, is we've got, um, there was a film done by a friend of ours, Hannah, who did this film called From Women to Men, all about the female shadow. And we've got a long interview with her and a long interview with a couple of the other women who appeared in that film about the female shadow and about their ownership of, of the ways they've acted out. And I think, What's interesting as well now is that there is a cultural, as I said, we're about a year after Me Too, and I think the cultural conversation is now at this point of recognising we had Me Too, this kind of essential voicing of a lot of suppressed anger, a lot of, suppre a lot of boundary setting by women saying, no, this is not acceptable behaviour. And where we are now, especially with Asia Argento, one of the prime movers of the Me Too um, movement mm. has the, has turned out to be it looks a sexual predator herself who'd paid off an underage guy that she'd slept with and there was a really interesting article quite recently by Barry Weiss in the New York Times where she said this shows that women are human too which is basically what a lot of people have, have wanted to hear. It's like this, this very simplistic dynamic of women as only victims and men as only perpetrators is such a, a, a one-sided dynamic. Mm. And now the cultural conversation seems to have swung to, to this, this place where we are hopefully allowed to say 
men have a dark side, women have a dark side, and it can now be a more balanced conversation. And that's what I think is really exciting about the content we're putting out, because I think we're asking that question. And we're also asking, especially in the response to the red pill, like there's one thing is the film, and the, uh, the other thing is the cultural response to the film and the incredibly harsh reception that it got from a lot of media platforms, especially millennial platforms like Vox and um, Vice. I mean, The Red Pill was a very controversial film, mm. and there were quite a few things said about it, and it was when we were in America interviewing Warren Farrell, and he happens to be a neighbor of Cassie J, the, the woman who made it, and Cassie J still describes herself as a liberal, she was a feminist when she went into making the film, and I, I had a bit of a suspicion as a filmmaker watching it, it just seemed so convenient that a self-described feminist would go inside the men's rights movement and have her mind changed by what she found. And I have to say I was a little bit suspicious about that. I was a little bit suspicious about how, how it was a perfect narrative. And speaking to Warren, and this was unprompted, it, I wasn't kind of, we weren't interrogating him about Cassie's journey or anything like that, he just volunteered that Cassie had come to him and said, I went in, I wanted to do something like of an expose on the men's rights activists. And even when she interviewed them, she had in the back of her mind, a lot of feminist talking points and a lot of arguments with what they were saying. And it wasn't until she started watching the, the rushes back, watching the, the, the film back, the footage to make the documentary that she started listening more to what they were saying and understanding what they were saying and came out with an appreciation of, wow, there are some men's stories that are not being heard. There are some uh, struggles that men are having that are not being heard and are not part of the conversation. And so she, like I, I, I have pretty much 100% um, certainty that her journey was genuine. Mm. And this was a subtext of an awful lot of the, the coverage, the, 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 new, the sort of negative coverage of the red pill was people saying well it was just insinuating that it wasn't genuine that it was somehow it was funded by men's rights activists and it was a it was a trojan horse done by men's rights activists and i i don't believe that i think it was a genuine film i think it was a genuine journey and the irony is under a different in a different circumstance she might be looked on as a as a real feminist hero She's a very successful documentary filmmaker, uh, I think with a lot of bravery as well. She, she talks about she did actually lose some, some friends when she made the film and she, I saw recently she's even been outed or by the, Pover the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a kind of anti-extremist organization in America, which seems to be an extremist organization itself. It, it had to backtrack it. It outed Majid Nawaz recently mm. as an extremist. And he is an anti-extremist, former Islamist. That's really fascinating. What can be said in the culture and what can't be said in the culture. And the fact that a documentary like The Red Pill, which along, along with the men's rights activists in it, also had a lot of feminist um, scholars in it as well. And you don't have to kind of agree with everything that the men's rights activists are saying in it. Um, but in terms of a film that adds an interesting perspective, I think it's definitely, it definitely is that, that film, which is why it was really interesting to talk to Cassie. Yeah. Just to back to your point about what you said, I found that really interesting. In a different setting, she might be hailed as a feminist hero. I think that's true. And I'm just trying to imagine what that setting might be. It's certainly, it certainly seems kind of impossible now with the way feminism has moved, at least, because it's much more around it is inextricably tied to the same postmodern ideologies that a lot of um, activism is tied to, a lot of critical theory is kind of, and academia is linked up in with the oppressor oppressed. Again, a name that just came up when you were talking, um, another very successful woman, Claire Lehman, who created the magazine Quillette, out of her kitchen, and it's now one of the sort of most, the biggest media success stories of the last couple of years. But because Quillette is very deliberately anti-identity politics and anti the social justice left. She is attacked on Twitter rather than celebrated as a, as a successful woman. The fact that it doesn't really matter, even if you, the ideology trumps the personal story pretty much all the time with the identity politics left. Mm. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's also, 
it's an impossible bind and it's also an interesting, it's, a, it, it's an interesting indication. The reaction to Claire Lehman and Cassie J, it for me really points to this weirdness that we live in where the, the identity politics left in particular has kind of the reins of um, what's culturally acceptable and, and a lot of pop culture power and a lot of um, media power. So they cannot, even though they can act as the oppressor, they can never admit that they're acting as the oppressor because the entire worldview is based on there's only oppressor and oppressed. And so- And they are always on the side of the underdog. Yeah. And so this makes it impossible for them to look inward at themselves and realize that they now have the power or a lot of power, a lot more than perhaps they realize or maybe not realize, but want to realize. Um, and they're not using it responsibly. And this is, uh, this, this is the story of the last few years for me. I think it, it, you see it echoed everywhere and you see it echoed in the gender discussion as well, I think. So let's just hear a quick clip from that interview with Cassie. I know that it helped a lot of people uh, making this film and, and um, but I don't think it's, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be. And I, I think the Red Pill movie was just a very early kind of icebreaker into these conversations. But I think we have a long way to go with gender relations and, um, and hopefully eventually finding a healthier relationship between the genders. And the other interview that we're really excited about putting out is with Warren Farrell. And we've talked before about how if you see culture as a kind of fractal pattern, then the, the, the fractal pattern or the patterns that we saw during the late 60s are still here, but they've just got bigger. And the, the gender dynamics that first erupted in the 60s, the rise of, of women's liberation and feminism, and this, this now, to me, feels like we're in the same dynamic. But we look back and we kind of look through the wrong end of the telescope and we assume that everyone back in the 60s was part of this movement, but the fact that, it, that we know about it shows that it wasn't universal. It was, um, it was an outlier, it was a new thing, it was, it, we were always attuned to the new. And what's interesting about Warren Farrell is that he has been living this dynamic, this same dynamic since the 60s. Uh, he's a fascinating individual story because he was one of the very first male feminists, he was part of the, he was on the board of the National Organization for Women in America, and he, he then at the same time started leading men's groups. And in the men's groups, he was hearing stories that he realized were not part of the conversation. And when he started bringing the experience of the way that men have been hurt and the way that men feel that they have to perform certain gender roles and that they are seen as success, he, he uses the, the words, for example, that yes, women, women are often objectified and seen as sex objects and judged by their looks. Men feel that they're often judged by success, he calls success objects. Mm. They're judged by their ability to provide, they're judged by um, their wealth, they're judged by their status. And there was this beautiful moment. I, I, I really, I know that we both really enjoyed meeting him and spending time with him. There's this really beautiful moment towards the end of the interview where he said, Men have makeup too. Male makeup is I am Dr. Warren Farrell, best-selling author of The Boy Crisis. Um, and what's my makeup? I'm doctor, best-selling, author, um, that's all makeup. It's me being afraid of saying, I'm also Warren Farrell, vulnerable human being in these five or six ways. Considering he's often framed as the father of the men's movement and the men's movement, especially in America, has a really bad um, reputation and, and perhaps quite rightly. I mean, I asked him that in the interview, whether he agreed that some of the bad press that the men's movement had was deserved and he agreed that it was. And I think Certainly, a lot of the tactics that I see from some of the more extreme men's rights activists in America, I can see why they have a bad reputation and it's not, I don't think it's doing their, their cause any good. They, they kind of turn into the thing that they're supposed to be fighting against. But, as I said at the beginning, Warren Farrell is someone who's very much focused on what do healthy relationships look like? What are the things that need to be expressed from men and from women so that we can have healthy relationships. And if we have a culture where men are on one hand encouraged to express their feelings, but also on the other hand, often the culture will describe it as whining when men do express their feelings, there's a kind of double bind. And a lot of men feel stuck in that at the moment.
Yeah, what really struck me about Warren Farrell, aside from him as an individual who I found um, very authentic, uh, is his, his focus in, in The Myth of Male Power, his first kind of best-selling book. It's very nuanced and it's really a balanced perspective of going into the economics and that also dictated the relationship structures we had for a very long time and pointing out that it's not as simple as just saying men were patriarchs and they held women down and just you know because they're dysfunctional in some way it, it was it was a lot more complex than that and yes some of that went on of course but it was also a case of men had to go out and be the breadwinners men were expendable as well um, and then we shifted in the 60s and maybe slightly before to different kind of relationship for the first time ever happening. So this is all very new. The dynamics we're experiencing are really fresh. Like, yeah, and so, and now we, he said in the interview, a really nice thing, which was around like, we're not designed to be functional. We're designed in terms of like relationships, how we relate to each other as men and women. It's like, we're designed to be dysfunctional. We're designed to survive basically is what he says. And that, you know, so we have, he says, we have an opportunity now where we have, a lot more equality to figure out how do we, how the hell do we get on with each other in a, in, a, in a way that is conducive to our health and our children's health as well. And I found that was the overriding message I got from him, I think is in his work as well, is it's really about, I find that a really useful framing that globally, and I think we might have talked about this before, what we're seeing is the result of an incredibly dysfunctional relationship. It's like, the gender dynamics we're seeing on the ma mi macro scale feel like the a micro scale would be like two parents having a massive argument. More like two teenagers having a massive argument, I think. There's a second part to that interview with Warren Farrell, which is going to be a Patreon exclusive. So if you want to see that, become a patron. I hope that we are now at a stage where all sides of that debate can be heard. Because the eruption of Me Too, which was October last year, it, were, it was said quite explicitly at times, men, now is, now is not your time to speak. And I can understand that because these are a lot of the time were voices that haven't been heard for a long time. And, but that it cannot remain, that cannot remain as a dynamic. By definition, a relationship has to be both sides speaking. Um, and, and I think a healthy relationship is where both sides are allowed to speak. And I think a healthy cultural dynamic is when something like the red pill is made, it is not immediately shut down, it is not immediately criticised as, as I think Vice called it, you, men's, a men's rights bullshit documentary. Another thing just came up for me that, that he said, um, relating to the, the, the kind of that, I guess, necessary outburst that happens after uh, Me Too was, you know, because he's a therapist, he said, obviously the longer someone's held something in, the more it comes, the more anger is behind it when it finally comes out. And that I think was, that was very evident there and that makes sense. Um, and I wonder now, I see that anger as well in the men's rights movement as well. And I understand why it's there too. I do. But the, what the next stage looks like for me is a kind of a meeting where the anger has extinguished itself somewhat. And maybe we're getting to that point but where the conversation comes, it's a conversation about responsibility, I think, ultimately. It's a conversation on both sides around um, what does it mean to be responsible for yourself and your actions as a human being, whether you're a man or a woman. That's what you do in, couple, you know, in couples counseling. You talk from the I, you talk about yourself, you talk about, you don't, you know, actually, again, Warren made a really good point where he said, having a dynamic like, um, feminism has at the moment where everything is men's fault. I'm, I'm being broad with feminism. I'm talking about maybe the, the worst sides of it. Where everything is men's fault, he equates it to a man going to a psychiatrist and sitting down and being like, right, okay, well, I'm here, but what you need to know is that everything is my wife's fault. The reason I'm feeling like is because of her, and I've listed out 14 points around where she's a total fuck up, and I'm going to list them out to you, and you better agree with me, otherwise I'm going to stop paying you as a therapist. It's like kind of similar impossible dynamic where nothing can happen. That I still feel is what we're kind of largely in. And that's why people aren't allowed to talk at university. That's why Cassie is still, as of like today, getting slammed in the press and why there's just a lot of mischaracterization all around the place. Um, and I think something has to give, some kind of humility or humanity has to give 
um, in order for that conversation to start happening. And on that point, it might be a good time to talk about uh, Hannah's film. Yeah, so this is one of the most interesting, and it's a sort of experimental thing that we've done. Hannah produced this film, which has gone pretty viral on, online, called From Women to Men. I am a woman who has been hurt by men. I'm a woman who has hurt men. Who has hurt men. And she's a, she's a conflict negotiator. That's what she did for many years in some of the world's sort of most intractable conflicts. And the thing that she realized is that we cannot move forward until we own our part of whatever dynamic. We can't move forward in any, in any conflict until we own our side and we own the stuff that we've done. Um, and she then went through a process of sending this poem out to many other women and they then came together to make the film and a lot of them would then choose the bits of the poem that really spoke to them, the things that they'd done in the past. And a lot of them said they went through a real process through doing it as well. So it's a really controversial piece. It's, it's had a really polarised reaction online but it's had about a million views altogether. Mm. And I've seen a lot of, especially men from some of the, the men's groups that I've seen online, very touched by it. A lot of people said it brought them to tears. I dream of a time when we all take responsibility for the part each of us plays in this battle. When we can truly empower ourselves by owning our part of the mess. And bring an end to the cycle of hurting and blaming. I begin today. I begin today. I begin today. I begin today. So we've got a couple of films off the back of that. One of which is an interview with Hannah and a couple of the other women who appeared in the film asking why, why they got involved in the project in the first place, what they got from it and what the reaction was, whether they have any regrets. And another film which is slightly more experimental, which is and as Hannah said in her, in her film, what she wanted was to start a new kind of conversation between women, women and men. And so we try and model that with Hannah, her friend Elan, who appears in the film, myself and Raffia, who is a, a facilitator, a therapist who's been working for about 40 years with the, these issues, the male and the female. So basically this is an attempt to model this kind of conversation. What does a healthy conversation between men and women look like? which involves us taking ownership of our stuff and then meeting from a place of real ownership and real communication. And we'll see if that works. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it kind of has to work. I think at some point globally, that kind of conversation has to be the norm. And in fact, again, to bring it back to Warren Farrell, because it was a long interview and he said lots of interesting things, they're doing it in uh, Denmark. They're, having, they're teaching children these types of conversation and that seems a natural thing, is that this is a skill that people need to have, um, is to be able to, and I think personal responsibility is the, the, the beginning of it. And I think what's really um, powerful about Hannah's film, or just powerful about just the idea of that kind of conversation, is that it starts with personal responsibility. And that's where, that seems to be what the culture is crying out for at the moment, is this kind of a reconnection to personal responsibility and a movement away from everything's about being oppressed or being an oppressor and either being a victim or a perpetrator. Um, it's the, yeah, it, it seems to me like it, that conversation can't really happen within that, the environment, within an environment based on oppressor oppressed. I think that just has to go, like the, the broken green, as we've called it. it ha it's not a place for that conversation to happen. That conversation needs to happen in some kind of new, m less ideological or post-ideological space, which hopefully is rising up somewhere or in the ether somewhere at the moment. Yeah, and I also want to say about Hannah's film that I've had very different reactions to it at different times. When I first heard it, when she delivered it as a poem in a therapeutic training, I was really touched and it was, it, it was a really powerful ownership. And then when I've seen it since, and I've seen the film, sometimes I've watched it and I've just thought, wow, this is just... It's so countercultural, it almost feels too much. Mm -hmm. Because on its own, it does feel unbalanced. It's like, well, okay, but, it, but that's kind of the point, is that it's almost like a little bomb 
in that inside that ideology because it's so anti the narrative that we live with all the time for women to pretty much just own their their stuff without any kind of context or balancing of men owning their stuff at the same time so it feels in on its own it feels slightly unbalanced but i guess that's that's the essence of great art in a way great art is not meant to make you feel comfortable it's most supposed to make you feel uncomfortable mm. and even i have felt uncomfortable watching that film every now and again mm. and yeah I, I hope that in the recording that we've put together with raffia there's a certain balance in terms of us owning our stuff and then building more of a complete conversation around it as well. As you're, as you're describing that, that I, I know that feeling. I call it like um, vicarious discomfort. It's like a, a sense of how something will land in the culture. And I feel like some part of me, which of course we're tribal pe beings, you know, even, if, even if there's a lot within the cultural milieu I disagree with, I still feel that twinge. I've, I've, again, I had a similar experience watching Hannah's film. I think the first time it was it's incredibly emotional. You know, it's a real, it's a really, but a real heartfelt feeling of like relief of like, wow, okay, that's, that feels really uh, just very loving and very responsible and like really a, a really powerful, loving, feminine energy that, that comes with that. Um, but also that feeling of like, wow, this is going to be dynamite. I remember that was the, that was what I thought the first time. So I was like, wow, this is going to, this is definitely going to ruffle some feathers, um, which it has, I guess. Yeah. But again, feather ruffling is, is the point of art. I think the point of good art and that's what leads to um, yeah growth. I think it's worth also saying that our interest in these subjects it probably comes from our own histories in terms of a lot of the the kind of the inner work that we've done around masculinity we both teach men's work and ultimately these questions can only be resolved really in an embodied way. It, it cannot just become a conversation about masculinity and femininity because then you get into this kind of swampy relativistic soup of well, what do you mean by masculine what do you mean by feminine surely we're just humans and then it it all starts to kind of become very relativistic very quickly whereas i know that my experience of doing work where i really connect with myself and in, in my masculine that there's a real embodied presence that i can bring to these questions and then a lot of these kind of gender dynamics resolve themselves very very quickly mm. and if you're watching this and you, you're interested in this subject we are teaching we've got a men's workshop coming up in november we've got a women's workshop coming up in september the end of september that is being taught by some amazing facilitators including hannah actually who did the film mm. and we've got a polarity workshop coming up in january as well so i think it's so important to tie this this content the ideas together with the embodied work because otherwise if we just stay up in the heads we just stay up in the conceptual realm and then nothing gets resolved yeah. i think it's also important to add none of the workshops are about telling anyone what masculinity or femininity is it's really because you can't it, it, you each individual has to connect uh, to what that is experientially within themselves and, and a space like that it's it's a flow state it's getting into a flow state and in the flow state, the concepts, the ideas, they are of like, they're not important at all, in a sense. It's the experience. And so experience, again, is also what really, like meeting human to human and communicating human to human, that's also absolutely key in developing our own ideas, but then also developing ideas collectively. And on that note, we also have another event coming up, which is uh, Join the Great Intellectual Awakening. Um, and that's going to be on eighth, the 18th of September in London. We'll put um, notes down in the show notes uh, with a link to it. Uh, but again, that event, it's not just us talking about... Um, what's us trying to... Well, this is pretty yeah. much us trying to create... Like we've always wanted to create a community around yeah. these ideas. Yeah. And this is our first event to try and create that kind of community. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Rebel Wisdom's work. We're going to talk about our history and show some of the clips from some of the films. Mm -hmm and then trying to create some kind of way of having, having these kind of generative dialogues, yeah. which we've talked about before. What does it mean to have a dialogue where you go in genuinely trying from a place of not knowing and inquiring and, and finding the answers for yourselves mm -hmm. rather than this kind of very ideological way of trying to kind of persuade someone that you're right? Yeah, or what Jordan Greenhall would talk about is like the old broadcast model where someone, you know, we 
culture be broadcast to you and ideas be broadcast to you. And we live in a different paradigm now, which is the more uh, decentralized kind of knowledge sharing. Uh, 18th of September, if you're in London, come along to the Great Intellectual Awakening. And one other thing, we've got, we've recently put up a few pieces on Patreon for patrons only. We've got a, an, another amazing piece with Tim Lott, who we had an interview with recently, talking about the links between Jordan Peterson and Alan Watts. Um, Jordan Peterson has often been described as doing for Western philosophy and Western um, spirituality, what Alan Watts did for Eastern spirituality back in the 50s and 60s. And there's really interesting parallels between the two and really interesting differences between the two as well. And Tim Lott, who was the first guy to write a profile of Jordan Peterson for The Spectator magazine in um, l yeah, last year, also is an expert on Alan Watts. So we had a really interesting dialogue with Tim and that's, we're going to put that live on Patreon in the next few days. So if you're interested in that or you want to see the second part of the Warren Farrell interview, then become a patron. Thanks for watching and see you next time.